So today we are going to talk about human immunodeficiency virus and AIDS. AIDS is the disease which is caused by HIV and AIDS is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So this AIDS is actually the end stage of HIV infection. So we'll talk about that and many things about HIV and AIDS in this class. I have divided uh, this class into two half, okay? Because it's a quite a lengthy one. So in the first half or part one, I will talk till the pathogenesis of HIV and AIDS. And in the next class, I'll talk about clinical feature, investigation, and the management. Now, uh, HIV virus or human immunodeficiency virus is the causative agent of AIDS. We all know that, okay? Right from the microbiology class or even immunology class, or even before that, even before you have joined MBBS, you know what is the causative agent of AIDS, that is HIV. This illness was not that very ancient or old, okay? It was first described in 1981, not that long ago. And the virus was first isolated by the end of 1983. So these are important landmark for us, 1981 and 1983. The illness was first described in 1981 and the virus was isolated in 1983. By the end of 2003, okay, WHO or World Health Organization has declared this disease as global health emergency. The cases are so many everywhere in the world that WHO has uh, announce this disease as a global health emergency by 2003. Remember these days which disease is everywhere in the world, okay? That is COVID-19 caused by SARS uh, coronavirus 2, isn't it? So similarly, uh, the uh, similar type of pandemic, you know, these days, wherever you go is HIV and AIDS. The character of the epidemic in different regions of the world has been influenced by the relative frequency of each of the routes of transmission. That means if I take different example here, in some of the countries, uh, the, the modality or route of uh, sexual uh, contact is homosexuals, okay? And in lot other countries, that is heterosexual. So both, you know, routes of transmissions are quite important, okay, in the transmission of HIV. So we'll talk about that later when we reach uh, what are the modality of transmission of HIV. This HIV belongs to retrovirus family. Retrovirus belongs to RNA virus. So this belongs to retrovirus family. Now, why the name retrovirus is there? Because of, because of the enzyme which is present in these viruses, that is reverse transcriptase enzyme. This reverse transcriptase enzyme has a special property. This enzyme can transcribe DNA from viral RNA. In other words, it can synthesize DNA from RNA, okay? Exactly opposite to what we have learned before because DNA is the first thing which will give rise to messenger RNA, then protein synthesis will occur. That's what we have studied. But in this case, the DNA is synthesized from viral RNA. So this is the job or function of reverse transcriptase enzyme. Because of this property, these are called retroviruses. After this DNA is synthesized, this DNA will be incorporated into the host DNA. This is a very, very important step in the pathogenesis of the disease. We'll talk about that later. Now, retrovirus comprises three subfamily. These are Oncovirinae, Lentivirinae, and Spumavirinae. Okay, now Oncovirinae, a uh, good example is HTLV1 and 2. Now this HTLV are human T cell lymphotropic viruses. Okay. 
and they uh, can lead to leukemia. Okay. Leukemia is hematological malignancy. So these are called oncogenic viruses. The name itself says oncovirine, oncogenic virus. Lentivirine, okay. the perfect example which belongs to this group is HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. It's a slow virus group. And spumavirine, okay, just the classification, these viruses, they don't have any pathogenic potential. Okay. Oncovirine, lentivirine, and spumavirine. HIV belongs to lentivirine family. Now, human immunodeficiency virus are of mainly two types, HIV-1 and HIV-2. HIV-1 is pandemic all over the world, but HIV-2, which is slightly less pathogenic in comparison to HIV-1, is mainly confined to the West African country. But th these days, there is a evidence of some spread to the Indian subcontinent and other parts of the world as well. Indian subcontinent means mainly the South Asia, from where we belong. So uh, HIV-2 is also uh, spreading a bit more than before these days. But HIV-1 is much more pandemic than HIV-2. Now, we have reached to a very important part of this topic, and that is viral structure. These questions can easily be asked in your exam. A viral structure, what type of structures are there in the viruses, okay? So let me explain this with the help of a, a picture. Now, this is, this HIV is an envelope virus. Now, we all know uh, from where that envelope is derived, isn't it? This is a host-derived envelope. As always, in any viruses, if they are envelope virus, the, the membrane of the envelope is uh, derived from the host when they bud out from the cell surface. There are surface glycoprotein, okay, on HIV. These surface glycoproteins are mainly GP120 and GP41. GP120, GP means glycoprotein, glycoprotein 120 and glycoprotein 41. Now, in the beginning, glycoprotein 160 is produced by the virus. That GP160 is cleaved, okay, to form GP120 and GP41. Now, so this GP120 and GP41 has got different functions. GP120 is the receptor, okay, on the virus surface. This GP120 will interact with a host cell receptor and they will get attached. So never forget this. GP120 will attach on the host cell receptor. Then what is the function of GP41? GP41 is called the fusogen or fusion peptide. So it, it acts like a stem, okay, on the surface of HIV. And on that stem, GP120 is there like a cap. Okay? So you can also remember this GP41 holds GP120 on the surface. Now, Let's talk about genome of human immunodeficiency virus. What are the different types of genes which are present in HIV? There are two copies of the single-stranded linear RNA present in HIV, and there are three important genes which are present. These are called GAG gene, POL gene, and M gene. Now, GAG gene, POL gene, and M gene. Okay, so let's elaborate a little bit more about them. GAG gene translate into large polyprotein which are clipped into four further smaller type of proteins and these are matrix protein or p17 capsid protein or p24 and nucleocapsid protein which are known as p7 and p9 so remember all of them starts with p that's why we remember this p17 p24 P7 and P9. These are called proteins which are derived from GAG gene. Now, pole gene, okay, first it will translate into pole polyprotein, 
and this polyprotein will be cleaved into further smaller proteins. These are three main enzymes here, protease enzyme, reverse transcriptase enzyme, and integrase enzyme. Protease enzyme, reverse transcriptase enzyme, and integrase enzyme. All of these have got a very, very important role to play. Now, N gene, N is an enveloped gene. So it translated first to N polyprotein, this is a bigger one, we already talked about GP160. And this GP160 is further cleaved by a host cell protease or proteolytic enzyme into GP120 and GP41. Okay. So these are the important three genes in HIV. Now, out of this, this, this is a, a bit of you know repetition slide. Most of these things we have already done before. So these are uh, different names of the protein there. Matrix protein, P17, okay. P7 and P7 and P9, viral nucleocapsid protein. P24 is a viral capsid protein. And there are three enzymes, reverse transcriptase, integrase, and protease. Now, what are the functions of these three enzymes? Clearly written there, reverse transcriptase, copies the RNA genome into double-stranded DNA. That means it synthesizes DNA from RNA and that DNA will be integrated or incorporated into the host cell genome or DNA by integrase enzyme. And protease, the name itself suggests, it will cleave or break down the bigger protein particle into a smaller one. Now look at this picture here. Okay. This is a very informative picture, highly informative one. So I'll give a little bit, bit of time here. Look at this outer surface first. Okay. This is called envelope of HIV. Envelope. This is envelope of HIV. Now in this envelope, two main okay, glycoproteins are present. These are GP120. This, this rounded structure is GP120. And this stem. See this, this stem which is holding this rounded particle like a cap is GP41. GP41. This is GP41. And this is GP120. Okay. Now, what are the other other protein which starts from P? See there, P17 is a matrix protein. P24 is a capsid protein. Okay, capsid. And some other P7 and P9 are the nucleocapsid protein. Okay, nucleocapsid protein. See this. So this is enveloped, this is capsid, this is nucleocapsid. And these are the two strands of RNA. Two strands of RNA. These are important one. So uh, after that, which are those three enzymes which are uh, produced by HIV? These are reverse transcriptase is here protease okay protease and then integrase so reverse transcriptase protease and integrase so uh, roughly you know what are the important you know component of hiv structure this lipid bilayer as i've already described before is host derived okay this is host derived uh, you know component and this, there is one, you know, uh, structure, or we can say compound, which is called myristic acid. This myristic acid is present in the outer envelope. Now, after knowing the structure of HIV, uh, before I go into the further discussion, I like to request you to draw this uh, structure many times until and unless you are quite familiar with this, because these are the common things which are asked in your exam. Now, we have entered into the next phase of the discussion that is called mode of transmission. So how HIV is transmitted from one person to the other. You all know the most important modality of transmission is the sexual intercourse of HIV. That sexual intercourse can uh, occur from the vaginal root as well as anal root. Vaginal and anal. Vaginal or heterosexual intercourse is uh, 
very common all over the world. We all know that. But homosexual intercourse is also uh, one of the cause of transmission of HIV. Now, there's one very important point here. Many of those people or many of those patients are also having coexistent sexually transmitted infection other than HIV, like syphilis, like herpes virus, okay, like chancroid, isn't it? Or like lymphogranuloma venerium, any of them. So if they are having those STI, then the chance of transmission is much more higher than other people who don't have STI. What may be the reason for that? The reason is very easy. Those STI, they can cause ulceration on the genital area. And from those ulcer, uh, ulcer or ulcerated area, the entry of HIV is much more easier. That's why and they will have more chance of infection. Now, one small point here, passage of HIV appears to be more efficient from men to women and to the passive partner in anal intercourse than vice versa. What do you mean by that? If a man is already a uh, disease or already is having HIV infection, you will easily give that infection to his female partner because let's, let's compare the genital of male and female, okay? We say female genitalia or vagina has much more larger surface area than the male genital. So that is the reason why female will get infection easily than the male. Another modality of transmission is vertical transmission, that is from mother to the child. This is also known as mother to child transmission, okay? MTCT, mother to child transmission, which is a better term than vertical transmission. And there are three important way by which vertical transmission occurs, intrauterine, perinatal, and breastfeeding. Intrauterine, perinatal, and breastfeeding. Now, intrauterine, very easy to understand. This HIV virus can enter the placenta or it can uh, go through the placenta and infect the baby. So the baby is not at born, it is still in the fetal stage. So intrauterine infection can occur easily. But more common one is the perinatal uh, way of infection. So perinatal, what is perinatal period? Okay, I've been asking this question during pediatric discussion. Perinatal period is when the period of viability start from that moment till the seven days after birth, that is called perinatal period. The period of viability, in some of the textbook, it is mentioned 22 weeks and another 24. So whatever you want to say, it's okay, but till the seven days after birth, this is called perinatal period. So birth period also comes under perinatal period. That's why majority of HIV infection in the baby occur in perinatal period. The third one is breastfeeding. Let's not ignore this important way of transmission. Breastfeeding is another very, very important way of HIV transmission. We'll talk about that later. Now, some of the European studies suggest that without intervention, 15% of babies born to HIV infected mothers are likely to be infected. Although rates of up to 40% have been reported from Africa and the United States of America. Now, what do you mean by that? Without intervention means what? Without intervention means if we do not use antiretroviral drug, okay? If you do not deliver the baby by cesarean section, these are the two main intervention you can do here. If that thing were not done, then there is a high chance of transmission of HIV to the baby, as high as 40%. An increase vertical transmission or mother to child transmission is associated with so many factors like advanced disease in the mother. Okay, this is very easy to understand. Increased maternal viral load, the more viruses are present in the mother, more chance of uh, you know of passing those viruses to the baby. Another point may be prolonged and premature rupture of membrane which is called PROM, because those membranes are actually acting like a barrier. 
once those membranes are ruptured, then easy entry of viruses to the baby. And any infection in that area, okay, any infection in the genital area or infection of those membranes which are protecting the baby, like chorioamnionitis, can increase the risk of vertical transmission. Now, transmission can uh, occur through the three way. Let me repeat once again, intrauterine, okay, perinatal and breastfeeding. Among them, if the question is asked, which one is much more common? The answer is perinatal or uh, near, near about the time of birth. What is the role of breastfeeding? Breastfeeding has been shown to increase the risk of vertical transmission by up to 20%. Okay, 20%. So remember this. So as far as possible, we don't advise the mother for breastfeeding. But this is highly controversial statement. According to World Health Organization, breastfeeding should be continued even if HIV positive mother give birth to the baby. We'll talk a little bit about that a bit later. In the developed world, they have certain interventions to reduce the vertical transmission, like the use of antiretroviral agents. Not in the developed world, even in the developing world and all over the world, actually, these days, we use antiretroviral agents once a patient is confirmed to have HIV. Second modality is delivery by caesarean section. And third one is avoidance of breastfeeding. So if we do all these three, then there is a dramatic fall in the numbers of infected babies by mother to child transmission. This is a very important question for you. If the examiner asks, how can we decrease the modality of transmission by a vertical route or vertical way or mother to child transmission? Your answers are these three points. One, use of antiretroviral agents in the mother. Two, use of caesarean section at the time of delivery. And three, avoid breastfeeding. Now, what are the other routes of transmission, the other mode of transmission? Contaminated blood, contaminated blood products and organ donation, those organs from the uh, infected people or patient is another way of HIV transmission. That's why these days before blood transfusion, HIV test is the must, okay, everywhere. And the doctor, who orders this blood transfusion has to has to watch whether there is a level of HIV negativity there or not. Very, very important point. Another way is a contaminated needles use, which is mainly done by intravenous drug abusers, okay, or sometimes accidental a needle stick injury can occur in the healthcare personnel, like the doctors and nurses. Okay, so those are uh, some other modality. Now, some point regarding this, healthcare workers have a risk of approximately 0.3% following a single needle stick injury with non-HIV infected blood. Look at the percentage, which is quite less, isn't it? 0.3%. But nevertheless, okay, there is a risk. The important point is there is a risk. So as far as possible, we must avoid it. So if you are taking care of HIV positive case, okay, you should remember this. Accidental neuralistic injury to yourself can transmit the HIV to you from that patient. In comparison to hepatitis B virus, okay, the transmission by neuralistic injury in HIV is very less, but there is a risk. Another point with so many people, okay, ask all the time to the doctors. And they have this uh, query, which is coming in, a, in their mind is, what about blood sucking insect like mosquitoes and bed bug? Do they cause the transmission of HIV from one patient to other? And the answer is no. There is no evidence that HIV is spread or transmitted by uh, this type of insect. And another one, simply hugging the patient doesn't spread HIV. Kissing the patient, doesn't spread HIV, okay? So HIV is mainly present in the blood, 
and genital fluid of the patient. Genital fluid means semen and vaginal fluid. These are the important point. Now, another part of this class is pathogenesis. Now, how HIV after entering into the body, how it leads to the disease? This is called pathogenesis. Let's talk in detail about this. Cells which are infected by HIV are the most important among them is CD4 cells or helper T cell, followed by CD8 cell or cytotoxic T cell, natural killer cell, macrophages, dendritic cell, and even the microglial cells and central nervous system cells or the neurons. So these are the different types of cells which are infected by HIV. But the first answer here must be CD4 cells. Now, how this HIV enter into the host cell or CD4 cell or other types of cells? That's the first point uh, we should discuss here, okay? Now, during the entry of this HIV into the host cells, certain other co-receptor helped it. These are called chemokine co-receptors like CCR5 and CXCR4. CCR5 and CXCR4. These are called chemokine co-receptors. They help the entry of HIV into the host cells. After HIV enters into the host cells, okay, there is a process known as syncytium formation. The syncytium formation is gluing okay gluing or attaching of multiple cells into one big giant cell so this is called syncytium formation and by this mechanism these cells will die so this is also known as cytopathic effect of hiv infection look at this picture here okay this is called syncytium formation see here Multiple cells are glued or attached together and uh, all of these cells will die, okay? So what will happen here? Uh, for, let, let's see, let's take one example here. In this cell, there is entry of HIV first, okay? Now these cells, HIV will multiply inside the cells uh, with, the, with the help of a host genome. Then these, these uh, cells will express different types of antigen uh, from the cell surface and then multiple other cells will glued or is attached together and from syncytium formation or multinucleated cells formation and all these cells will die now this is how cd4 cell destruction will occur now remember what's the function of cd4 cell in our body okay all the students know this answer cd4 cells are called master cells of the immunity. Once the CD4 cells is stimulated okay, or come into the picture, it will stimulate the whole immune system. So here is a origin point, isn't it? This CD4 cell is the target cell for HIV. So they damage, they kill the cell so that the whole immune system will be suppressed. Both cell mediated immunity as well as humoral immunity, both are suppressed. But if you want to choose which one is more suppressed, your answer is of course, cell mediated immunity. So as a result of this, the intracellular pathogen cannot be controlled or cannot be killed properly. Okay, so in HIV or in advanced cases of HIV or AIDS, there are lots of uh, infection with intracellular pathogen. But at the same time, even the humoral immunity is stimulated by CD4 cell activation. So even some bacterial infection, which are mainly caused by capsulated bacteria are much more common in HIV and AIDS. These HIV viruses can directly damage our nervous system, can result in okay, different manifestation in the CNS. Now, this pathogenesis is better understood if we talk about the life cycle of HIV, how, how this life cycle gets completed in the host cell. Let's talk about this. So 
the first step has to be binding of HIV on the surface receptor of the host cell. Then, okay, there will be the fusion of host membrane and viral membrane. Then, the nucleocapsid has to be uncoated. Okay, uncoated. After that, the that special enzyme will come into the picture, which is called reverse transcriptase. It will transcribe, okay, RNA into the DNA. Now, this DNA will be integrated or incorporated into the host DNA. This is called latency phase of the virus. And because of this latency phase, this virus cannot be completely killed. Okay, killed is not a good word actually in case of viruses. It cannot be eradicated from the body. That will be a better term. That's why uh, HIV is not a curable disease till today. Okay, a lot of a lot of resources, a lot of activities, a lot of work are going on. How to kill this virus? How to get a cure? But till today, okay, uh, HIV is is also known as uncurable disease. And if your examiner asks. If a teacher asks, what's the reason for that? The most important point is this latency of the virus. After that, there will be transcription. That DNA will synthesize a lot of RNA, and those RNAs will undergo into protein synthesis mechanism. Okay, a lot of host, uh, sorry, a lot of uh, viral proteins are synthesized. They should be assembled, and there will be a budding. So this will complete the uh, life cycle of HIV. So let's discuss this uh, with the help of a picture. See here. What is the first uh, step here? Attachment. Look here. These cap-like structures are GP120. Okay, GP120. These stem-like structures are GP41. Okay, uh, this is called capsid, and the inner one is called nucleocapsid. These are the strands of RNA, and these are the what are these? These are the different enzymes which are present in HIV. So, are three main enzymes reverse transcriptase, protease, and integrase. Now, see here, this GP120 is attaching okay, with the CD4 cell receptors. CD4 cell receptors. After that, after that, okay, see here, the host cell membrane, host cell membrane. In this case, the host cell is CD4, and the viral envelopes are attached with each other, and then there will be uncoating of this nucleocapsid, and the virus has entered into the host cells. See here, the RNA has come out, which is called uncoating. This RNA has got a special property, I have told so many times, by this reverse transcriptase enzyme. So, DNA will be synthesized. This DNA. Okay, a double stranded DNA would be integrated or incorporated into our host DNA. See here, this red structure. Okay, please note it. This red structure is the, is the viral DNA. See here. Okay, this, this blue structure is our host DNA. Look at the center of this host DNA, it is incorporated right there. Now, this is called a latency phase. And this DNA start to synthesize RNA now, mainly the messenger RNA. Okay, messenger RNA. See here, this messenger RNA will synthesize different proteins. So, can you name those proteins once again? These are called matrix protein P17, isn't it? Or P24, and some other like P7 and P9, or even the glycoproteins GP120 in the beginning, which is a proteolide into. GP120 and GP41. Now, after that, after that, this RNA along with these proteins will be assembled and form new viruses particle. And this virus particle will bud out from the surface and they will be ready to infect some other cell. So, this is how uh, uh, the life cycle of HIV would be completed. Thank you uh, for, for going through okay, uh, these uh, different parts of the HIV discussion. I will give uh, questions in the next time. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. 
So today I'm going to continue the discussion about HIV and AIDS. This is a part two of the discussion which we have, I have started before. So let's continue it. In the last class or in the last time, I talked about uh, the structure of HIV, what type of virus is this, and the pathogenesis. In the pathogenesis, we also discuss about the life cycle of HIV, very, very important question. So I urge you to revise this uh, many times till you become confident. Now, let's start today's class by discussing about the clinical features of HIV infection. Now, in the beginning, you should understand one point here. HIV infection is a very broad term. When HIV uh, virus or human immunodeficiency virus enters into the human body, from that moment, okay, there are different phases of the infection or different stages of the infection. And the final or the terminal stage of HIV infection is called AIDS or Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. So AIDS is the final stage or the most serious phase of HIV infection. So don't get confused there. Now, one very important point, which you already, uh, I'm sure you have got from the last discussion, why HIV causes immunodeficiency, okay? Every student should know this answer because it attacks CD4 cells. CD4 cells means T helper cell. And these T helper cells are, we say uh, from immunology, they are the master cells of the immunity. And these are the cells which controls the whole immune system. So HIV preferentially attacks the cell. And by doing so, it weakens the whole immune system. Now, there are two pathways or branches of the immune system, isn't it? The important one. Forget about the innate immunity for the time being. Uh, let's talk about acquired immunity, humoral and cell mediated. Okay. So ultimately, both wings of the immunity or immune system are dysfunctional after HIV infection. Now, what is the incubation period of HIV? It is usually two to four weeks. And we all know incubation period means from the moment the organism enters into the body till the appearance of sign and symptom. This is called incubation period. Now, before um, talking further, let me talk about uh, these two graphs here. Okay? As a medical student, you must know how to analyze these type of graphs. They really help you to understand the whole concept of the topic. See here. On the uh, y-axis, the CD4 T-cell concentration, okay, in the numbers, and in the x-axis, there is a time or months after the infection. So zero means the virus has just entered into the human body, okay? Now, there are different uh, colors, okay? And these different colors are depicting different types of graph. So let's focus on the green one now, okay? See here, this green one is for the P24 antigen. Remember in the last class, we talked about this P24 antigen is one of the antigen. Uh, which is uh, produced by the virus. Now, this antigen is start to rise very early. Okay, start to rise very early in the after the infection. So, even in the phase of acute infection, the P24 is detectable. So, if facilities are available, we can go for P24 detection for the early diagnosis of HIV infection. Now, let's focus on the a red graph or red line. Now see there, this red line are the CD4 T cells or the helper T cell. So in the beginning, they are not that low or in the acute infection stage, they are not that low. They are low, see here, in this phase they are low, but they are not that very low, okay? But once the infection continue in the human body, the different stages or the phases of infection here, Okay, chronic lymphadenopathy, subclinical uh, infection, 
skin and mucous membrane immune defect and systemic immune deficiency are, are the stage of AIDS. So the CD4 cell drastically decreases once the disease becomes chronic or severe. Now, what about this antibody against GP120? This is called anti-HIV antibody. Remember the test ELISA, okay? And even the Western blot, they detect this particular antibody, which is produced by our immune system against the HIV virus. Now see here, in the very early period of infection, this antibody is absent. It is not uh, that, uh, you know, or the level of this antibody is not that high, okay? It takes time for the production of antibody inside our uh, blood. So around four to six weeks after the infection, then the level of this antibody gradually increases and it remains throughout the infection until and unless when the stay uh, or the stage or phase of AIDS you know comes then only the level of this uh, or uh, I should say antibody drastically decreases okay now let's talk about another graph you see that what is the difference between the first graph and this graph okay. everything is same okay. everything is same uh, except from CD8 T cells here. Now, the CD8 T cells in the beginning, in the acute phase of infection, it is not that involved. But later on, okay, in the stage of AIDS or in very severe condition, the CD8 cells also drastically decreases. So these are some of the very important points. So let's talk in detail about the different clinical stages and clinical features of HIV infection. The first one is called primary illness or a zero conversion phase. Now, majority of these zero converters are clinically silent. That means they don't show any particular signs and symptoms. Okay? In some of the percentages are self-limiting non-specific viral illness occur. This usually occur around six to eight weeks after the exposure. That means after the virus enters into the human body, around six to eight weeks after that, okay, they develop non-specific illness like fever. This fever is not that high grade. It is usually low grade fever. Arthralgia, myalgia, lethargy, non-specific lymphadenopathy, sore throat, ulceration in the mucosa especially oral and sometimes a transient type of maculopapular rashes now remember they are never specific signs and symptoms because they may be present in many different types of viral infection some of the neurological symptoms are also seen in this type of condition or in this phase i should say like headache photophobia myelopathy Milo is the term in this case for spinal cord. Okay, affection of spinal cord occurs, which is called myelopathy here, neuropathy, and in very rare cases, encephalopathy means involvement of the brain. And this illness lasts up to three weeks and recovery is usually complete. Which the, the patient recover from these non-specific signs and symptoms, and then this patient will go into the phases of asymptomatic phase or we call it persistent generalized lymphadenopathy or also known as latent phase. And uh, there are not uh, much signs and symptoms, so uh, the disease is usually undetectable. Now, before we go to that uh, stage, let's talk uh, quickly about what are the lab abnormality in this phase in primary illness means, how can we guess or suspect or diagnose primary illness of HIV infection. If you do some blood test, there will be lymphopenia, means decreased number of lymphocyte with presence of atypical reactive lymphocyte in the peripheral blood. Okay? There may be thrombocytopenia and raised liver enzyme as well. If we analyze the percentage or the ratio of CD4 to CD8 lymphocyte, okay, 
because CD4 lymphocytes are depleted here. So the ratio of CD4 to CD8 is reversed. Remember that graph, CD8 cells are not affected in the beginning. So CD8 cells are normal or in, they are present in a normal number, but CD4 cells decrease it. That means the ratio is reversed. Antibodies to HIV may be absent during this early stage of the infection because it takes time for the formation of antibody. That means ELISA test is not that very useful in this phase. But if we do a PCR for the viral RNA, or if we do some test for the detection of P24, then that uh, condition can be diagnosed. Another phase or stage of HIV infection is called latent phase. We also know call that stage as a clinical latency because a majority of the people or the patient of HIV infection are asymptomatic for a long period of time in this phase. Okay, and different studies have shown that the median time of clinical latency is about 10 years, but some of the patient may have clinical latency up to 15 years as well. There is one particular term in this clinical latency phase, which is called persistent generalized lymphadenopathy. Now remember, when we talk about what are the causes of generalized lymphadenopathy in human body, HIV and AIDS is definitely one of the important cause. So your answer is right here, okay? These nodes are usually symmetrical, they are form, they are mobile, and they are non-tendered. These are the important feature of any viral infection which causes lymphadenopathy. And there may be associated splenomegaly as well. So these are some of the important feature of PGL, which is an important part of clinical latency, a latent phase. Now, another phase is the symptomatic HIV infection and AIDS. Now the patient is going towards the worst uh, phase of the most severe phase that is called acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. This phase or stage develops once the viral load rapidly increases and CD4 cells drastically decreases. Okay? Once CD4 cell falls, okay, the whole immune system becomes very weak. So as a result of that, a lot of infection can occur in the human body. Not only the infection, many malignancies can also occur. Now, there are certain HIV symptomatic diseases which help us to suspect maybe this patient is very immunosuppressive and may be having HIV or AIDS. So these are oral hairy leukoplakia, okay? oral hairy leukoplakia, which is caused by Epstein Barr virus. This is a, one of the clinical situation caused by Epstein Barr virus. Please don't forget that. Another one, recurrent oropharyngeal candidiasis. Now, recurrent candidiasis is never normal okay, in a person. If candidiasis is recurrent, we always suspect immunodeficiency syndrome. And AIDS is one of that. In female, recurrent vaginal candidiasis, similar. Severe pelvic inflammatory disease. Cervical dysplasia, okay, which is a pre-carcinogenic condition, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura or ITP, weight loss, severe weight loss, more than 10% of the body, weight, chronic diarrhea, usually lasts for more than one month, herpes zoster infection occurring in the human body, again, one of the marker of immunodeficiency, peripheral neuropathy, and low-grade fever and night sweats, which usually occur for more than one month. Even more important than those are the AIDS defining conditions or illness. Now, let me remind you once again, this AIDS defining illness or conditions are developed once the CD4 cells reaches a critical stage. That critical stage is less than 500 or very commonly in any of the condition which, which, which we have listed uh, below, even less than 200. If CD4 cells are less than 200, then a lot of AIDS defining conditions will arise in the human body. And these are extensive candidiasis of bronchi, trachea, or lungs, 
means lower part of the airway esophageal candidiasis which is always considered very serious carcinoma of the cervix and this is also invasive type of carcinoma coccidioidomycosis disseminated or extra pulmonary remember this coccidioidomycosis is a type of dimorphic fungus cryptococcus okay cryptococcus cryptococcus neoformans is a type of yeast okay so central nervous system is usually affected here cryptosporidiosis okay is a type of protozoa it can cause chronic diarrhea cytomegalovirus extensive cytomegalovirus disease other than liver spleen or lymph node cytomegalovirus retinitis is one of the example of similar type of condition which usually causes loss of vision hiv related encephalopathy one of the part of its defining illness or condition herpes simplex and chronic ulcer or bronchitis pneumonitis or esophagitis by the similar type of organism extensive histoplasmosis kaposi sarcoma very important condition always remember if they listed or if they ask you kaposi sarcoma in in a, in a, any type of patient that indirectly show this is a case of aids and this kaposi sarcoma is a type of malignancy of the blood vessels and in this type of people this kaposi sarcoma commonly occurs on the skin and the gi tract burkitt lymphoma immunoblastic lymphoma or primary cns lymphoma all of these can occur in terminal cases of hiv infection so we call them aids defining illness infection by different types of mycobacteria like mycobacterium avium intracellulare mycobacterium kansasi mycobacterium tuberculosis okay all of these are aids defining illness in this type of people pneumocystis carinae pneumonia now these days they have changed the terminology for pneumocystis carinae it is known as pneumocystis gyrovesi okay but still if you use the term pneumocystis carinae you are not wrong okay we we clearly understand what we are talking about so this is one of the very important its defining condition recurrent pneumonia in a particular patient septicemia caused by salmonella toxoplasmosis of the brain and wasting syndrome due to hiv wasting syndrome means severe weight loss all of these are regarded as a its defining illness now i have uh, you know compiled some of the pictures from different uh, you know websites from internet site or even from the textbook okay so it will help you to understand the topic even better see here this is oral cavity okay how i know this is oral cavity okay as a tongue so depress the tongue here okay. this is called uvula uvula this is uh, a soft palate and here is the hard palate okay now there is extensive white patch occurring on the back side of the palate as well as throat so this is candida another uh, you know picture which is showing candida this white patches are the candida and and look at this this red ulcerated areas in between this is herpes simplex virus infection okay this is extensive one here is kaposi sarcoma okay kaposi sarcoma on this patient you see this this is kaposi sarcoma okay here is the one so this is a a type of malignancy uh, which develops from the blood vessels now after discussing those different clinical features let's talk about how to confirm the diagnosis of hiv and aids or in other word what investigation you like to order or if you want to treat the case then what type of monitoring you do regarding the management so some of the baseline investigation in a newly diagnosed asymptomatic patient with hiv infection are always start with blood investigation like complete blood count or cbc differential count and peripheral smear are part of that and esr okay that is a routine type of investigation regarding the biochemical test 
serum liver and renal function tests as well as, well as blood glucose analysis should be done okay these are also considered the routine baseline investigation now remember some of the student uh, sorry some of the teacher may ask you what is the purpose of doing this baseline investigation your answer can be given in two different way one they may help indirectly uh, in the suspicion of the disease in hiv there is lymphopenia lymphopenia mainly the cd4 cell count will go down okay uh, and another way of answering is we are going to start or use different drugs for the treatment of the case though hiv and aids is not a curable disease it still different type of treatment options are available and these drugs have many side effects so just to know what was the biochemical value before we use the medicine we do this different type of baseline test now some of the immunological tests are lymphocyte subset means what is the percentage or you know proportion of cd4 to cd8 cell okay what is the viral load what is the status of hiv antibody okay uh, elisa and western blot both you know detect hiv antibody hiv viral load which is done by rna analysis hepatitis serology a b and c which can occur together and cytomegalovirus antibody can also be done because it is quite common in case of aids patient regarding some of the microbiological test toxoplasmosis serology or tors screening syphilis serology vdrl or rpr and screen for other sexually transmitted infection must be done the routine type of test because once we diagnose one type of sti or sexually transmitted infection in a patient other sexually transmitted infection can also be very common because the modality of transmissions are same for the diagnosis of cervical dysplasia or cervical carcinoma cervical cytology must be done and that is done by pap smear now a bit about immunological monitoring so you always uh, count what are the numbers of cd4 lymphocyte in the patient okay and we all know the number of cd4 cell drastically decreases in the case of hiv infection and they are very very low once the patient reaches aids stage i already told you they may even reach less than 200 cells or sometimes even less than 50 okay rapidly falling cd4 count and those below 350 are an indication to consider highly active antiretroviral therapy H A A R T, highly active antiretroviral therapy. This is the name of the regime which we use in the treatment of HIV infection as well as AIDS. Now, these are usually done every three month interval. How to monitor viral load? Okay, the monitoring of the viral load is done by measurement of RNA copies of the HIV. And this is uh, usually done with the help of PCR, polymerase chain reaction, PCR. Remember, these days we are fighting against another type of pandemic in the world, that is COVID-19. And that, that confirmatory test for COVID-19 is also PCR. Okay, we call this, we call that RT-PCR. Do you know what is the full form of that? RT stands for reverse transcriptase pcr that means with the help of that pcr the rna of the virus will be converted into dna and then okay with the help of a routine type of pcr uh, it will be detected a similar type of concept we can utilize here as well if the viral load is very high that means the chance of infectivity is very high okay once the person reaches terminal stages of HIV, the viral load drastically increases. Now, we have reached to the final stage of the discussion, how management of the HIV is done, okay? Now, let me start with one sentence here. There is no cure of HIV infection. 
and almost 100% of the students know this fact. Not only the medical student, any layman or any public know this fact. There's no cure of HIV infection or AIDS. Okay. Then another question immediately comes in your mind. Then what is the purpose of treatment if there is no cure? Isn't it? Now the answer is we can prolong the life of the patient because of the treatment. We cannot permanently remove the virus from the body, but we can decrease the level of those viruses to undetectable state so that patient will live longer. Okay, so this is the purpose of using HAARD therapy. Another question immediately comes why we cannot cure HIV? Now, if you have listened carefully in my last lecture also, I've explained this point, okay? Now, why, why is there no cure? Can anyone answer me? Of course, this virus remains in the latent phase. And remember, uh, where, where this latency occurs, okay? In the human DNA. Remember, because of this reverse transcriptase enzyme, RNA from the virus will be converted into DNA and this DNA will be integrated into the human DNA. And because of this single point, okay, we cannot completely remove virus from the body. So cure is not possible till today, but research is going on, okay? So probably in the near future, we hope cure would be available. Now, what are the aims of HIV treatment? The aim is to reduce the viral load to an undetectable level. That means less than 50 copies per ml of the serum for as long as possible. And that can be done with the help of HAARD. Another aim is improve the CD4 count or T helper cell above 200 cells per millimeter cube, which is, if we do that, okay, if we do that, a lot of those immune related conditions of the disease would not occur. Another important aim is increase the quantity and improve the quality of life without unacceptable drug related side effect or lifestyle alteration. And that can also be done with the help of medicine. Okay, improve the quality of life, prolong the life, that means quantity. If a pregnant lady is diagnosed with HIV and AIDS, then we must reduce the rate of transmission to the baby. We have to do that, okay? And there are different ways to do that. So that is also another aim of the HIV treatment. Now, there are so many things, okay, we can discuss under this management. If a patient is HIV positive, and if that patient doesn't want their family member to know about the disease, and if they request you, doctor, can you do that? Please, I want, I want this disease. Uh, you know, I don't want any other people to know about my condition. Then you must respect their decision. This is called confidentiality. It must be strict in HIV. Even before, uh, before, you know, checking anyone, whether they are positive for HIV or not, we must take the consent, okay? Informed consent has to be taken. Then only we can send the blood to the lab. This is a very serious disease and people already know this is an incurable condition. So there, there will be a lot of psychological stress. So psychological support must be provided, not only for the patient, but also for the whole family, okay? even the friends and the care giver or caretaker, whoever they are. Another important point here, if a lady is HIV positive and if she wants to start her family, if she wants, wants to have a baby, it's completely her decision, okay? So if she wants to discuss this particular situation with you, you should give her all the important information, but the final decision would be made by her. 
you are not going to make any decision from a side. Now, what are those antiretroviral drugs? Or what are those highly active antiretroviral drugs? Okay, they, they are divided into different you know, classification or different headings. The first of them are called nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor or NRTI. And look at the example. Jalcitabine, didanosine, lamivudine, okay, zidovudine, stavudine, avacavir, and tinofovir. These are the different drugs. Okay. Among them, okay, I will teach you how to remember this very easily. Remember the you know suffix budine, zidovudine, lamivudine, stavudine. Very easy to remember, and these are very commonly used drug from this classification. NRTI, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor is another uh, type of drugs which are called NNRTI, and they are nevirapin, ifavirenz, and delavirin. Nevirapin, ifavirenz, and delavirin. Okay. These are NNRTI. Another group of drugs are called protease inhibitor. They are indinavir, okay, ritonavir, nelfinavir, and sequinavir. Indinavir, ritonavir, nelfinavir, and sequinavir. Okay, all of them are ending similarly. So this is how we remember these drugs. And other drugs. Okay, which do not uh, belong to this group are infovirutide and maraviroc. Okay, these are some other medicines. If you uh, you know uh, look any pharmacological book or any research paper, probably some other drugs are also listed, but these are the more important one. Now, what side effects can occur in the patient after use of these these drugs or medicine? The common side effects of nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor or NRTIs are peripheral neuropathy, okay, pancreatitis, hepatic steatosis means fatty liver or even lactic acidosis, anemia or neutropenia because of affection of bone marrow, myopathy or cardiomyopathy, and extremity fat loss. The important one are peripheral neuropathy, bone marrow suppression, and pancreatitis. Now, regarding uh, protease inhibitors, the common side effects are gastrointestinal intolerance, distribution of fat in the body, hyperlipidemia, very important question you may get, insulin resistance or development of hyperglycemia, probably because of the affection or damage of the beta cells or pancreas, bleeding in hemophilia patient, and liver enzyme derangement because of affection of the liver. Some of the side effects of NNRTI are Steven Johnson syndrome. Okay, Steven Johnson syndrome is a type of drug allergy, a drug reaction, and even hepatitis. Now, let's talk a bit of practically here. Which type of medicine I choose if we confirm the diagnosis of HIV and AIDS in a patient? Okay. What what is the combination of the drug for us? Now, those combination of the drug are two NRTI in combination with either a boosted protease inhibitor or one NNRTI. So let me revise again: two NRTI means two nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor plus either a protease inhibitor or one NNRTI. So if I want to take uh, the names of this drug, I will take zidovudine and stavudine. Those are two NRTI plus either one of the protease inhibitor like indinavir, or if I don't want to use any protease inhibitor, I may choose nevirapin as the NNRTI. So this is how uh, the drugs are chosen. Now what is the indication? In which case we use these drugs? Are these drugs used immediately after diagnosis or there has to be certain indication? Now see there, treatment should be recommended for all patients 
with symptomatic HIV disease. That means if there are any symptoms present, or AIDS defining illness, or CD4 count that is consistently below 200 cells okay, per cubic millimeter. 200 cells or less than that is severe condition. That is AIDS condition already. Presence of AIDS defining illness, definitely uh, these drugs are recommended. And even the symptomatic HIV disease after the confirmation, okay, these are indicated. Now, when, when we say our heart therapy or highly active antiretroviral therapy is successful, okay, and that is when the viral load is less than 50 copies per ml of the plasma within three to six months of the therapy, then only we, we can say or we can tell our patients, yes, okay, you are getting much better with this treatment. Now, during the use of this medicine, which are highly active antiretroviral therapy, what are the monitoring you want to do? Okay. These are routine type of things, just, just go through them. Clinical history and examination, okay. we do that all the time in the ward, we do that every day. Taking of the weight, measurement of the HIV viral load, which has to be consistently going downwards, and once there is consistent less than 50 copies per ml of the plasma, then we'll be satisfied. Measurement of the lymphocyte subset, CD4 cell count, CD8 cell count, full blood count, we do that routinely. Liver and renal function test, fasting lipid profile, probably this may be a side effect of protease inhibitor, and even the blood glucose, which may be high again after protease inhibitor use. So these are the routine monitoring tests. Viral load and CD4 count should be measured at 12 weeks and then at three monthly interval. Okay, these are relatively expensive type of test and we don't need to do that every day. So they are done at 12 weeks first and then at three monthly interval after that. Now, there are certain special situation regarding the management of HIV infection. The first of them is seroconversion stage. But remember, seroconversion is the stage of primary infection. The primary infection means after the virus enters into the human body, okay, the early stage where this disease almost looks like any other viral infection. So the usual time is about two to six weeks after the exposure. In patients with severe and prolonged seroconversion illness, once you diagnose HIV, heart is indicated here. Okay, but remember, you need to confirm the diagnosis first. Then, highly active antiretroviral therapy is indicated. What about in children? How we how we treat them? The general principle for the drug management of HIV in children are the same as those for adult. You don't need to change your management plan. They are the same. Another very important situation is the perinatal transmission of HIV. That means mother to baby at the time of birth. But strictly speaking, the meaning of perinatal transmission is not only at the time of birth. Remember, perinatal period starts once the period of viability is reached. From 24 weeks of the gestation till 7 days after birth is called perinatal period. So HIV can be transmitted from the mother to the baby during any of these stages. Inside the uterus, at the time of birth or delivery, and even after the delivery by breastfeeding. Okay, so all of these are part of perinatal transmission. Now, the question is, how to decrease the chance of transmission? Okay, remember the discussion in the last class. There are certain different way. One is the use of highly active antiretroviral therapy. Once the lady is pregnant, okay, from the second trimester onwards, these, these drugs can be started so that they drastically decreases the viral load so that the chance of transmission towards the baby is very less. That is one way. Another one, 
what is the modality of delivery of HIV positive lady? We always go for caesarean section. Okay, always go for caesarean section. And what about after the birth? After the birth, if possible, you don't advise for breastfeeding. But this is a highly controversial statement. Okay, according to old health organization, the breastfeeding should be continued because WHO says the chance of death, especially in the developing world, from other illnesses like pneumonia, like diarrhea, and like malnutrition are much more higher than the death caused by HIV. And mother's milk is very, very important from the prevention of mortality from those conditions which we have just listed. That's why WHO is to recommend to continue to breastfeed, especially in the developing country. Okay. Now, the likelihood of transmission is decreased to the order of 8 to 18 percent for gyrovidin alone, 2.6 to 10.2 percent for gyrovidin and lamivudin if they are combined together, and 8.2 for nevirapine and 0 0.8 to 1.8 for gyrovidin and caesarean section together. So you don't need to remember this percentage as such, but just make a concept out of it, isn't it? Remember, without using any of these intervention the chance of transmission may be as high as 35 to 40 percent. Now, with the use of these uh, different intervention, look at the percentage there, they drastically decrease. So that is the message for you. Okay. Now, higher rates of reduction are observed in industrialized or developed world when drugs are started at 16 week, that is from the second trimester, when they are continued in the neonate after the delivery, the four to six week, then the chance of transmission is very, very less. If we decrease the maternal viral load to less than 1000 copies, okay, per cubic millimeter, the risk of transmission is even less than 1%. Very, very important you know, concept. Gyrovidin should be commenced or started as an IV infusion at the onset of labor, and the neonate should be treated for four to six weeks after the birth. Now, sometimes what happens? Okay, let's let's uh, not talk about ideal situation all the time. Sometimes that lady uh, may have gone to the hospital at the time of birth only. So what we do during that time? Still, we give antiretroviral therapy and after the baby is born continue that for four to six weeks okay this is advisable a screening for hiv in the baby okay should be performed at birth should be performed at birth and remember at birth you don't go for detection of antibody okay we don't do a detect antibody at the time of birth even if the antibodies are present in the baby, those antibodies must have come from the mother side. So they, they don't confirm that baby is infected. Rather than that, we go for RNA, okay, or pro-viral DNA detection. After that, at six weeks and at four to six months, we go for screening of HIV in the baby. If all these tests are negative, okay, then we make sure or we confirm vertical transmission has not occurred means this baby is safe so at the time birth at six week and at four to six month all if all tests are negative okay, vertical transmission is ruled out now another very important point here okay you are a doctor you are a nurse or you are a healthcare personnel who is working in any healthcare setting or setup accidentally accidentally okay while taking care of the patient you are pricked by the needle or any instrument what are you going to do okay this is a very uh, you know important situation isn't it the person will be very anxious here okay 
the Rukhi cannot probably sleep at the night. What should I do now? Will I get HIV infection from that patient? All those things. Okay. So listen very carefully. In this situation, we have to start okay, antiretroviral therapy. Okay. Now, what what type of antiretroviral therapy we use or prescribe? The same type of therapy which we discuss or use in the diagnosed case of HIV and AIDS. Okay. Now see that zidovudine, lamivudine, and indinavir or nelfinavir. Zidovudine and lamivudine are NRTI. Indinavir, okay, or nelfinavir are protease inhibitor. So this is the same type of combination we use in this case as well. There is no extra type of drug. Another point is when should we start and how long should we give this drug? To start this medicine, it has to be started as soon as possible. We don't need to wait, you know, any longer. And it is usually given for 28 days or one month. So three drugs as soon as possible for one month. Okay, it will uh, decrease the chance of HIV uh, infection in this way. Now, what else? How to prevent other type of infection in HIV positive case or in case of AIDS? Remember, these patients are immunodeficient. They may get many different types of infection. So the concept is provide the vaccines if they are available. If vaccines are not available, probably according to the CD4 cell count, you have to give certain drugs, okay, certain antibiotic or some other antifungal drug or whatever. This is the modality of the prevention. Patients should be immunized with hepatitis A and hepatitis B vaccines if they have not taken before. Pneumococcal vaccine can be given. Okay. Live attenuated vaccines should be avoided, which are BCG and oral polio. And measles vaccine is one of the exception here or MMR vaccine. This vaccine is safe and it has to be given in this type of people. Now, how to provide primary prophylaxis in case of HIV? Okay. There are so many opportunistic infection which can occur in case of HIV, okay. like pneumocystis carina pneumonia, and that can be uh, prevented okay, by cotrimoxazole or pentamidine for toxoplasmosis. We can go for cotrimoxazole again, and for mycobacterium avium intracellularly, we have to go for azithromycin or clarithromycin. Now, for the phylaxis of other opportunistic infection, okay, the, look at the name there. Uh, some, some of the infections are repeated here. Pneumocystis carinae, again by cotrimoxazole, toxoplasmosis, cotrimoxazole, cryptococcus neoformans, itraconazole, and tuberculosis by rifampicin. And mitobacterium avium intracellulare by azithromycin. The certain indications are also highlighted there. They are all, you know, guided by the level of CD4 cell count. Okay. Now, at the end, I prepared some questions for you. Please uh, go through those questions and make your concept very clear. Okay. Thank you so much.